start. So, welcome everyone to our, our program today. I'm Terry Magadie, Chair of the Elder Law Committee for the uh, Trust and Estates section. And the first thing we start with um, is, oh, I remind everyone, before our sponsor, I like starting with sponsors because that's that those are the people we have a lot of gratitude toward. But before I even mention sponsors, um, the MCLE credits will, certificates will be going out to people shortly after the program. And everyone should have a, a link to the materials for the program. And with that, I would like to start showing our appreciation and thank you to our sponsors. Our first sponsor, Nancy Sanborn, the Sanborn team, uh, probate and trust, real estate experts. Uh, they've been our sponsor for the, the longest period of time. And uh, they specialize in real estate and all the areas that we deal with. Um, older people, probates, trusts, um, all sorts of, uh, you know, conservatorship proceedings, things that deal with court and real estate. Those are the things that, that Nancy uh, and her team are, are involved in. So thank you, Nancy. And our next sponsor is here to introduce herself, Marit. Hi, everyone. I'm Orit Gadish, broker and owner of Geffen Real Estate, a dynamic brokerage specializing in serving the trust and estate community. I'm also a contributing author for the CEB, Continuing Education of the Bar, a program of the University of California. And I recently launched my book titled The Practitioner's Handbook for Probate Real Estate. For those of you who haven't read it, please take a minute to check it out. It's available on Amazon. Uh, and the link is in the chat box. Take a few minutes, read the reviews. If you're interested in reading it and providing a review, please text me. I'll have a complimentary copy shipped to you. And if we haven't connected yet or you need help with an upcoming real estate sale, please feel free to reach out to me and we can schedule a Zoom call to get to know each other. Enjoy your program and back to you, Terry. Great. And our next sponsor, which we'll show on the screen in a moment, is Marcin Klein and Glen Oaks Escrow, um, great escrow company. Uh, I've used them myself and uh, they specialize as with a lot of our sponsors in the areas that we deal in, conservatorships, trusts, probate administration. Thank you, Glen Oaks Escrow for, for being our sponsor. Our next sponsor is California Title Company, another player in the real estate field. Uh, who's the a title company that specializes in trusts and estates works, uh, probates, uh, conservatorships. Uh, thank you, California Title Company. And finally, Manufacturers Bank. And they're not even, uh, they're not only dealing in real estate, but uh, they have, uh, uh, pr uh, you know, developed a niche in the fiduciary field. And uh, they help uh, administrators, conservators, trustees. And thank you very much, Manufacturers Bank, for being our sponsor. And the next thing I want to do is mention our, our program coming up next month. Um, again, niche, air, niche topics. Um, the title is going to be The Struggle is Real, The Current Legal and Regulatory Landscape for Substance Abuse Disorder Providers. And our speakers are from uh, Nelson Hardeman. Uh, people know him, a very premier healthcare law firm. Zach Rothenberg and uh, Miriam Mackin. And people wonder why, why are we having something on substance uh, disorder providers? Uh, if you know our field, people who work in, in this business, elder law, fiduciary work, uh, there are a lot of beneficiaries that have uh, substance abuse issues. And if you're, if you're working in this field, you're, you're dealing with uh, providers of, of care for, for people like that, for beneficiaries of trusts, uh, family members uh, who have those challenges. So that's gonna be our next program, December 9th. And our program today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Brad Rosenheim, um, who's a real player in this field of entitlements and zoning. Um, he's been in the business a, a very long time, uh, started at least in the public sector with uh, Marvin Browdy's office and has just worked uh, in City Hall 
um, inside and then outside, uh, you know, for many, many years. And um, uh, I ran across Brad when I'm, I was representing, continued to represent a fiduciary, and we have lots of uh, real estate holdings uh, with this particular fiduciary. And Brad was very helpful with a, a tough commercial project um, that the fiduciary had in, in the Valley. And at the time, uh, I got used to hearing that, I think the expression, Brad's the man, I guess, do you hear that? Or the the uh, whoever it is, he's the one, he's the one, he's the person, you, you know, if you have a, a, a challenge with entitlements, with zoning, and particularly in the Valley, um, Brad's the person people go to. And uh, he was uh, extremely helpful on a very tough project we had. So we're fortunate to have him uh, today to talk about SB9, a law that's hot off the presses that affects, you know, people in the real estate business, people in the fiduciary business, just people everywhere in in, uh, in our state. So with that, I'll just turn the program over, over to Brad. Well, thank you very much, Terry. I appreciate it. Um, it's a pleasure to join you all today. Um, SB9 uh, was signed into law in September of this year and actually takes effect on January 1st of 2022. Statewide regulation. Um, and while it's law, uh, it's never been implemented. So while I'd like to say that I'm an expert on this law, I can really only convey to you its general content, uh, and then we can talk about it at the end of the, my presentation. Um, so many of you have probably heard of SB9. Uh, it really has activated folks in the state of California uh, to really start to look at how the state government is in many ways and in many people's opinion, usurping local land use control. And as a result, there are efforts that are ongoing right now to overturn SB9 even before it takes effect uh, because of the concern, uh, both philosophically about state uh, overriding local land use control and and then the fundamental potential impacts of SB9, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but a couple of groups that some of you may be familiar with that are really looking at this carefully and then looking at the state's role in land use overall and trying to control that are groups such as AIDS Healthcare Foundation, uh, which has been very active, interestingly, in the land use area for many years. Uh, there's a group called Valley Vote out of the San Fernando Valley. Uh, that was a group that uh, promoted secession, but they're looking at these, uh, these uh, regulatory um, uh, rulings that the state is uh, making upon local jurisdictions. And then there's a group called Stop the Sacramento Lab, uh, Land Grab. So these are all groups that are looking right now at uh, challenging SB9 uh, in all likelihood through a, um, a ballot measure uh, in the next year or so. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there will also be some legal challenges as SB9 progresses. So with that said, it, it probably is helpful to give a bit of a historic context to how we got to SB9. And many of you uh, may be familiar with city's efforts over the years to create opportunities to build granny flats uh, as a modest nod to the need to accommodate multi-generational housing in single family neighborhoods. And it was a small step and uh, you know, over the years I dealt with it a little bit, but it had very limited application and it was a some, they tended to be somewhat cumbersome and problematic to actually implement. And more recently, the state of California, the legislature has become much more involved in creating multiple units within single family residential zones. And that primarily took place uh, in 2016 with the strong um, uh, legislative um, approach to accessory dwelling units or ADUs as I'll be referring to them. Um, and since 2016, the state has continued to define the requirements and allowances for ADUs and at the same time limit the authority of the, the local municipalities as to regulating those secondary units um, in single family neighborhoods. And really what the state did was said, local governments, you have to allow ADU developments on single family properties. Um, so now 
uh, you can build a separate structure on your property, an ADU, and you can actually convert, for instance, your garage in your existing home to a junior ADU. And the difference between an ADU and a junior ADU is an ADU is a standalone, um, standalone housing. You can, uh, you'll have a kitchen in it, and you'll have bathroom facilities. A junior ADU allows you to have uh, certain limited kitchen facilities, and you can actually use the bathroom in the main house uh, in a junior ADU. So those are the, the fundamental differences between the two. Um, of course, the state uh, legislature has decided to become so involved in local land use for one primary uh, external reason, and that is um, the state, as most of you know, is really suffering from a severe housing crisis. Uh, the numbers are in the millions of units that the state is short to meet the actual population uh, in the state of California. Now, in many ways, this crisis is the result of municipalities that for decades adopted policies that really thwarted the creation of housing. Uh, rather than promoting it. So we're in this situation, we all experience it. Uh, if we have kids, we see the challenges that they have being able to afford uh, a, a home or even rent um, uh, just coming out of uh, school. Um, so it's, we all see this and hear about it on a regular basis. But there's also, we, while we have this crisis, we also have, and this is not intended to be a political statement, but there are some very progressive people in the state legislature. And many of the folks have, have said very clearly that they believe the time for single family zoning in particular in urban areas is no longer appropriate. They, they associate with single family homes and zoning with uh, past uh, exclusionary housing rules and regulations. And so that is one of the driving reasons for the ADU laws, but now SB9. And uh, again, it's a big change. Um, the practical implications are yet to be seen, but it is a big legislative opportunity, if you will. And that's why we see this strong reaction from these groups that are really uh, now becoming quite activated to uh, challenge the state's role in land use. So SB9, uh, as I said, will take effect January 1st, and it has two primary components. The, fir the first gives a homeowner uh, or a property owner in a residential neighborhood the right to create a single, another second dwelling unit on their property. The second part gives a property owner in a single family neighborhood the ability to subdivide their property. And then with that subdivision, they can create two lots or two homes um, on each lot, or they could do an ADU and a junior ADU. So there's um, a lot of opportunity. And uh, during the campaign, people put out a lot of information, those who opposed SB9 and, and feel it's a significant threat to single family neighborhoods, put out a lot of information showing six homes where there was one, and upwards of 10 homes where there was one at one time. Um, I don't know that that's really going to happen, but in theory, it could. So what I'd like to do is give you a broad overview of the um, components of the, this, this new law, SB9, and, uh, and then we can talk about what the implications are. Uh, so as I said, one of the components is SB9 allows single family property owner to build a second dwelling unit ministerially. That's basically going to get your permits. There's no discretionary action on the part of the city if you meet a number of uh, criteria that are established in the law. For instance, the uh, single family home must be in an urbanized area and that's defined um, by the Census Bureau information. Um, it cannot be in a number of areas. And I'll go through these areas. Uh, there are certain exceptions to these rules, but just broadly speaking, um, it cannot be in prime farmland, not that we have a lot in this area. It cannot be in a wetlands. 
An area that is uh, prevalent in Los Angeles is high fire severity areas. Um, and so you cannot take advantage of these regulations or these opportunities in high fire severity areas, but there are some outs to that. So in certain circumstances, you may be able to. Um, hazardous waste sites, uh, places that are subject to earthquake fault zones that are identified by the state geologists, um, areas prone to flood and inundation, um, and uh, habitat, protected habitat areas, um, lands identified for conservation, um, and also uh, conservation easements. So those are areas where you cannot take advantage of the SB9 opportunities that there are some outs to those, but broadly speaking, those are sort of red flags if you're in any of those areas, if you wanna consider taking advantage of SB9. Um, also, the housing can, um, you cannot demolish or alter a home if it is uh, subject to a covenant for affordability or if it's under any form of rent or price control. So if the home for whatever reason has those constraints, you're not gonna be able to take advantage of SB9. If the house was occupied by a tenant in the last three years, you're not permitted to take advantage of SB9. And a parcel on which an owner of that residential property has exercised their rights under the Ellis Act within the past 15 years, you're not able to take advantage of SB9. It also does not allow you to demolish more than 25% of the exterior walls of an existing home if, um, unless the local ordinance, a local ordinance is passed to allow you to demolish more than 25%, or if the site had not previously been occupied by a tenant over the last three years. So if, if it's owner occupied, you don't have that same constraint. <clears throat> Developments uh, in historic districts uh, or for which there's a historic resource are also prohibited. So again, there are a lot, of, a lot of rules here and it's important to be aware of it. It's just not universally applied. You, you have to understand that there are gonna be some constraints. Uh, the city can also uh, create objective standards. And uh, you know, those are height standards, um, uh, maybe uh, certain um, building standards, as long as they don't conflict with state regulation. For instance, the local agency cannot establish a standard that physically precludes the construction of, a, of up to two homes or that it would preclude either, either of those units from being at least 800 square feet. So, uh, you know, the, the, the city can't step beyond the bounds established by the law. Also, if you have an existing home on the site and you want to retain that home, um, you're not required to create uh, setbacks that are typical for single family homes. And if you're building a new home, <clears throat> you only need a four foot side or rear yard setback where oftentimes that can be upwards of 20 feet uh, for a rear yard or for a side yard uh, in certain zones. As far as parking goes, the city cannot require you to have more than one uh, parking space per unit. So in the case of building a second dwelling unit on your property, you only need two parking spaces. And even further than that, if you're within a half mile walking distance of a high quality transit corridor or a major transit stop, or if you're within one block of a car share vehicle station, you don't have to provide any parking. Now, an agency is able, a local agency is able to deny the housing development if written findings can be made identifying specific adverse impacts on public health and safety or the physical environment. And um, I would imagine there are certain cities that will try to do that, but it's a very high threshold and the state uh, um, uh, housing um, authority division will, uh, will carefully look at cities who try to do that. 
Uh, also, if you create a rental unit at a, as a result of this regulation, it has to be for greater than 30 days for rental. So you can't do short-term rentals uh, under the state regulations. And interestingly, a local agency will not be required to permit ADUs and junior ADUs if you choose to take advantage of the S SB9 allowance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cities are also permitted to adopt their own ordinance to effectuate the state law. They can be, uh, uh, they cannot be more restrictive, however, than what the state law includes. And I think we're providing a copy of the state law or have, comp, uh, and it's actually one of the easier state laws to, to read through and understand. Um, so you can get into the nitty gritty details if you like. And of course, there's all the cross references to other sections of the uh, of uh, state statute that apply um, as well. Now, for the subdivision of a lot into two parcels, again, it must be able to be approved ministerially uh, by the city if you meet certain requirements. So for instance, uh, the two parcels must be of approximately equal lot area and the smallest lot cannot be less than 40% of the original parcel size. So if you have a 10,000 square foot lot, the smallest lot you can uh, create is a 40 or 4,000 square foot lot. Um, again, the objective is to try to create comparably sized lots, but in certain instances, that's very difficult to do. Um, newly created parcels can be no smaller than 1,200 square feet. So you need a minimum lot size of 2,400 square feet in order to take advantage of the, par the parcelization under SB 9. Uh, a local agency can, by ordinance, adopt a smaller minimum lot size. I don't necessarily see that being uh, or happening uh, very quickly, at least uh, for most cities. And again, the, the parcel uh, being subdivided must meet certain standards very similar to those uh, that permit the two units. Uh, it must be in a single family zone, must be in an urbanized area as designated by the United States Census Bureau, or um, in an unincorporated area with the same US Census Bureau designation. Um, the same areas like the high fire severity areas under conservation easements apply to the subdivision uh, of the two uh, into two lots. Um, and similar requirements related to the affordable rental housing on the site. Um, and the, uh, or, or under rent or price controls, or a house that had been occupied by a tenant in the last three years, <clears throat> um, or where the Ellis Act has been exercised by the property owner. Um, can't be in a historic district, and the parcel was not established through a prior urban lot split. So you can't keep doing this to parcels. You get one shot, and that's it. The other thing is <clears throat> the owner of the parcel that's being subdivided or any person that is actually um, acting in concert with that person has not, cannot have sub subdivided an adjacent parcel under the urban lot split. So you can't buy a whole block of properties, at least under the same um, clear ownership and continue to do this up and down the block. <clears throat> So again, if these general criteria are met, the subdivision will be ministerial. There's no hearing that's required. The city cannot require you to do a street dedication or improvements to the street. Um, and they can provide certain objective standards again, but the effect of those objective standards cannot preclude the physical construction of two, two units on either of the resulting prop, uh, parcels. And the unit sizes can not be uh, forced to be less than 800 square feet each. You have the same setback requirements as I discussed earlier. That is uh, an existing home um, can have zero setback for a new structure. 
Um, or if you actually, if you tear down a home and you build a new home right on the same footprint, you're not required to have uh, setbacks. If you're building a new standalone structure, you can have a four foot side or rear yard setback. Um, denial is, you, this, the municipality can deny the request again, uh, but they do have to make findings and they're gonna have to be very uh, judicious about doing so. Um, one thing that the local agency may do is require easements for the provision of public services and facilities and, and utilities and such. And the new parcel that's created must have access to or provide access to or adjoin a public right of way. So in other words, you can't, in essence, landlock that, uh, that new parcel where you don't have access to the public right of way. Um, you still, you have the same parking requirements, one per uh, dwelling unit. And um, the properties are limited to residential use. Uh, interestingly, the applicant must sign an affidavit that they will live in one of the housing units that is a result of the subdivision for at least three years. So the idea is not to, um, in theory, make this a, uh, a large economic gain for uh, corporations, but allow individuals to take advantage of this. Um, same thing as far as a rental, it must be more than 30 days. Uh, and interestingly, the city through the subdivision cannot require the correction of non-conforming zoning conditions. So if for instance, you have an older home that doesn't meet the current setbacks, um, the city can't um, deny or force you to conform to the setback requirements uh, as a result of the subdivision that you might pursue under SB9. Um, and again, the local agency shall not be required to permit, permit more than two units on a single parcel. Now, the, the local agency can permit that, but they don't have to. Given the pushback that I've heard from many cities, um, I highly doubt that they will allow you to do the subdivision, create two units, and then create two um, uh, you know, additional uh, ADUs and junior ADUs on the property. Because most municipalities, uh, many of them have objected to SB9 as again, usurping their authority and changing the fundamental nature of single family um, neighborhoods. So uh, I'm gonna take a swig here. It's just water though. So, you know, a lot of people are now speculating what's this really going to mean to single to the single family neighborhood. Um, again, there are people who philosophically believe single family neighborhoods uh, no longer have a place in the urban environment. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are very worried and are protective of the single family neighborhoods and will challenge this as I as I mentioned earlier trying to strip the legislature of its uh, oversight over uh, local land use control. I'm not sure, maybe some of you have a better idea, but uh, you know, my, my local government 101 class, um, you know, one of the things that they uh, made very clear is that municipalities are, are really a creature of the state, right? The state authorizes cities to exist. So I don't know if by ballot measure that, that fundamental structure can be changed, but it'll be interesting to see. And I, I think you'll be hearing a lot about this over the next year or so. Um, now, uh, I think we are providing a study that was done by the Turner Center for Housing Innovation out of UC Berkeley. Uh, this was actually done in July of 2021 uh, on the impact of SB9 or the, the projected impact of SB9 nine um, in the state of California. I should just note that, again, it was written in July of 2021 before the legislation was actually finalized and voted upon. So there are certain aspects of the study that are not accurate as it relates to the actual provisions of the law. <coughs> um, so I, I think in, in broad summary, the um, the conclusion is that SB9 will not really change the dynamics 
of single family neighborhoods beyond the dynamic that already was set through the ADU laws uh, that were initiated in the mid, uh, well, 2016 or so. But just as a, a perspective on how ADUs are actually being utilized, um, jurisdictions reported to the state of California from 2018 to 2019, the number of ADUs permitted tripled, uh, that were permitted tripled over that one year period from somewhere in the range of five to 6,000 units to 15 to 16,000 units. The city of Los Angeles reported in early 2021 that the 20,000 ADU permits processed in the city, now I don't know over what period of time, but during whatever that period of time was constituted actually 40% of all residential units permitted during that same period. So that's a pretty substantial number, 20,000 in and of itself and 40% of all the total uh, units that were permitted. So. Um, Again, the time period wasn't disclosed. I suspect it may have been over several years, given the number of units that actually um, are permitted in the city of Los Angeles. I, it wouldn't surprise me that that was maybe from 2016 or 2017 through uh, the end of 2020. But in either case, it just demonstrates the ADU, um, the preference for it and the interest in it. Now, of course, getting a permit doesn't need, necessarily mean that that unit is built. Um, I, I think a couple of the takeaways that I got from this study that was done by uh, UC Berkeley is that the economics of, of actually purchasing a lot and subdividing it and then building new homes on it is somewhat um, suspect uh, between land prices, construction costs. It's really a question as to whether or not the economics can work. And I think a lot of that depends on the area um, in which the property is located, the size of the property, um, and the nature of the community. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of communities don't want to see a change in the nature of their neighborhood. And so individuals are not necessarily going to do this on their own. Now, if they sell their home to somebody who chooses to do that, obviously that's a possibility. And I've received a couple of calls from folks who are interested in pursuing this once the law is effective at the beginning of the year. It hasn't been an overwhelming number, but I suspect there will be people who will uh, use this as a business model and try to find the right spots to, to take advantage of it. Um, I, I think if I read the study correctly, they, they anticipate that SB9 could in, instigate the development statewide of roughly 700,000 additional units on single family lots. Um, and again, one of the constraints being the economic feasibility. I think that's one, one thing they honed in on. Um, they do point out that there might be uh, better financing. You folks probably know this a lot better than I do. Uh, financing options uh, for subdividing, for subdivided properties. Although if you have a current mortgage holder, I'm not sure how they would react to one's interest in subdividing that property and or building a second uh, dwelling unit on it. So those are things that are gonna flesh out over time and I think people will experience um, as, uh, as we go through uh, the actual implementation of the law. Um, so that's sort of the big, the big picture. Um, I would say that um, there will be areas that will see an influx of this. I think, you know, in the San Fernando Valley, for instance, we have areas where there are very large lots. And I think um, they may be more prone to, um, to seeing the ADUs uh, and or the, the subdivision of those properties. Um, and it will be uh, very interesting to see how those communities respond and if they become activated and become a part of this opposition to SB9 and again, the, the uh, the, the land grab that many people uh, suspect or cons are concerned with Sacramento taking over local jurisdiction. And just as an, an aside, I, I do most of my work in LA City, but I do work in some other communities and considered relatively liberal communities, but uh, I, there seems to be a consensus amongst the elected officials, even in these liberal communities about 
the Sacramento stepping into the local jurisdictions uh, business of land use. So with that, um, I will try to answer questions. Um, as I said, we've got a few questions in the, the chat and you know, we're, we'll take people from the audience first and to the extent there's time, I'll, I always have questions that I'll be able to throw out, but we'll, we'll start, I guess, the priority for the people have already put a question sure. in the chat box there. So um, this one question, what if a home is located in the area governed by the California Coastal Commission? My uh, recollection is that um, the coastal plan still prevails, but there's no public hearing required. So right now, you know, one of the um, big, big challenges to get through the process is the public hearing for coastal areas. Um, and my understanding is that uh, th those hearings are no longer required as part of the process to get your project approved. I can look through the law, but I, I'm pretty sure it's, that's the general uh, conclusion. Um, Let's see, can city charge fees so high? No, there are certain exemptions for fees. Um, so uh, the state basically tied the hands of cities um, in their ability to make it um, fiscally infeasible from the city side. So they thought of that one. Um, HOA, CCNRs. Yeah, so that the HOAs and CCNRs are basically overridden by this law. Um, and uh, I believe it basically says so in the law, but uh, state statute is very clear in this case that, um, that CCNRs cannot prohibit um, the effectuation of the lot split and or the two units on a single family lot. Now, I'll first to make sure there are no, do we have any other questions there before I start? asking some and then we could you know i'll interrupt any question i have for a question that somebody has in the the audience um you know you started mentioning you know the, you look at an area that you know very well the valley and you the first criteria you thought of are like homes properties with a lot of homes where single family home is there with a lot of square footage are there other when you look across our city or our county are there other regions that you that you think oh this is where entrepreneurs are are going to go and this is where entrepreneurs are going to stay away from because i i mean is it going to be more rural ish areas with a single family homes that haven't been developed much and are they going to stay away i mean are they going right into the right into the uh you know the most expensive parts of your valley with in in sherman oaks or in the west side where you know, they may have big lots, but uh, people will be pretty up in arms. They may not be able to do anything about it. Yeah. What are your I thoughts think, on that? You know, I, I think that the economics in Sherman Oaks or Beverly Hills or some of the other right. areas where you do have large lots, the cost of the land itself, right, is going to be, um, would be challenging to overcome. Now, if you have a, a, a large home, right, let's say you have a, an 8,000 square foot home and somebody buys it and thinks, wow, I can create a, a wonderful duplex here and subdivide that, that 8,000 square foot home uh, into a duplex, maybe, maybe the economics do work. I, I don't know. I kind of, I think it's going to happen more where you have, uh, and remember, it has to be an urban area. So, you know, there might be areas out in the, the Central Valley uh, that wouldn't qualify, but you know, in the in the city of LA or the surrounding region, you do have a lot of areas that have larger lots um, that are not, um, you know, not multi-million dollar properties um, where you may feasibly be able to do the subdivision, build two homes on it, and make it really work very successfully from an economic standpoint. I know. Uh, you know, the folks in Chatsworth, for instance, I've spoken to them about this and, um, you know, they see the ADUs and uh, popping up all over the place because they have large horse properties. And that's the other thing, right? The, 
the equestrian community is extraordinarily protective of uh, their ability to keep horses. And when they see uh, units moving in or being built that could constrain the ability to keep horses, they, they get very uh, activated by that. And so um, they're seeing that up there because you have those kinds of properties where it's a, you know, a 20,000 square foot property that could easily be subdivided and uh, accommodate two homes on each and possibly more. So um, it's, it's going to be really interesting. And I, I'm, no, uh, I'm no real estate investor. I, I don't have the stomach for that. That's why I do what I do. I, I tell real estate investors what they can do, but I won't do it myself. Um, but it, it will be really interesting to see. And I think there are folks, uh, as I said, I've gotten a couple of calls from people who are really looking at the opportunity um, as a business, a business model. Um, let's see, any, any other questions? I'm gonna keep asking then. Um, what about there are other, there's some communities around our, our state that there seem to be other restrictions that you know are imposed. The NIMBY, not in my backyard, the NIMBYism, you know, water, right? You know, I know certain areas I've dealt with uh, water. You have to have a water well, you have to have this, you have to have that. I mean, does this just override everything? Because if it does, somebody's property value who has a big property and prior to this time could only build one single family home on it and now could subdivide it. I mean, that's a, for, for certain properties I'm thinking about, um, the, the market value has just gone up tremendously. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not talking Sherman Oaks and Beverly Hills, but there are places with acres upon acres of land and you can only build a single family home on it. Right. So that's, and everybody knows who they are, I guess. You know, if it's their land or if it's their community, they, they, they know it. And if that's the case, that just, uh, that just really escalated their value. Am I wrong? I mean, that's. No, oh, it, it, it. You're absolutely right. And, you know, uh, presuming it, that area um, complies with the urban, urban criteria. But, um, you know, that's why, you know, I think you see people who see this as an opportunity, but at the same time, you have folks in that same neighborhood see this changing the, the absolute character of that neighborhood and really becoming uh, energized to see how that can be uh, um, reversed because they don't want to see that neighborhood change in that kind of fashion. So you could, I mean, locally, is there, what do people, you know, other than legislation, there way, you mean, if you go neighbor by neighborhood, there may be other mechanisms to, to stop it. The, the, the community organizations, the homeowners organizations will look at other criteria that, that may be put an, a, 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 um, a stumbling block. And then they try to use those. Do you see that? You know, uh, a lot of communities will attempt to do that. Uh, and then it's a question of whether uh, HCD, California uh, Housing and Community Development Department, will actually get involved. And I, I suspect they will. If, uh, if they're creating objective standards um, that are um, make it impossible or impractical to actually um, comply with the rules, the SB, the SB9 regulations and opportunities, the state will come in and, and smack the city around. Um, mm. And they're, but somebody really has to point this out to the state. Um, you know, I'm sure you, you all have heard about these housing elements that the cities are going through and the state oversees that. Now the state is gonna get, you know, hundreds of these housing elements from all the municipalities in the state of California. They have no capability of looking through the details of them to understand really, you know, where those little nuggets are that really kind of um, kill the ability to build that housing that they say is gonna be built on that property. So mm -hmm. it's going to take individuals to say to the state of California, hey, by the way, this housing element is flawed in these fashions, and you can't approve the housing element as a result of that. And the state is very receptive to that because they know their, their ability to do it on their own is limited. They rely on the community to provide feedback. So I think this will be the same thing with SB9. If cities 
uh, or even neighborhoods or associations attempt to do that, um, the state will step in. Mm -hmm. And pra practically, what, what gets it started? I mean, I assume right now, if someone goes out and they say, I want to do this, there's not the mechanism in place for them to do it. What, what are the steps that need to happen to have it in place? To, to have Maybe they are in place. You mean tomorrow, tomorrow we decide, I'm going to take that, you know, beautiful, uh, I meet the criteria. I got all the, you know, it, it, it all works for me. Uh, the city, wherever city you're at, may not have the department yet that's supposed to okay it, but it just, you, you, you theoretically, someone can start immediately. Well, January 1st, so For January 1st yeah, and yeah. January 2nd, you could go into the building and safety department. You should be able to go into the building and safety department and said, I, I meet the criteria. And I, I would imagine, I shouldn't say imagine, cities right now are, are developing their procedures to evaluate uh, the requests. So, um, you know, there will, there will no doubt be paperwork but the paperwork is not discretionary. It's basically demonstrating that you meet the criteria, whatever those might be. Um, and then the building, the building official is going to look at your plans and say, okay, you meet the criteria, just like you meet the building code um, or you meet the zoning code. And uh, we are going to issue you a permit. And the next thing you know, your neighbor, you'll see your neighbor yelling at you across the fence for putting a a, a new dwelling unit right next to their, you know, right next to the property line or four feet from the property line. And it is the evolution of this too, that we'll see all the cottage industries the same way everybody, you know, there are lots of ads you get for, we'll do your ADUs. They've got, you know, they're trying to get the model down, the business model, not for themselves necessarily doing it. People, I mean, certainly entrepreneurs are doing their own ADUs or, yep. or apartment, own, apartment building owners are doing their own ADUs. But then there's the whole industry of streamlining it for you. And it'll be, I assume, it's something similar. Absolutely. Absolutely. There will be folks who will, you know, for a fixed fee, I'm sure, will, uh, will usher your permits and your, uh, your subdivision, your parcel map, because you still have to get a parcel map. It's just there's no public hearing. It's just going to be a ministerial action on the part of the, the jurisdiction. Um, and there will be people who will create a very, probably a very lucrative, successful business in particular certain areas. Um, and if they come in with the whole package, right, well, we'll subdivide your property and we'll build your home or we're going to have a prefab home that is, um, that is already uh, permitted in essence by the city. If you do this particular model, uh, the cities are, are if I'm not mistaken, the city of Los Angeles has already approved certain prefabricated ADUs that can be put down on a lot with minimal um, uh, minimal permit overview or, or plan check overview because it's already been plan checked. So um, it's a you know it will be a great opportunity on those locations for which uh, the property can accommodate it and the economics work. And and did I I didn't hear it when you described it? Or the, I mean, when you have your two lots, that means you could sell one of them. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the idea. There's no on that end, other than the, you know, all the restrictions you mentioned, it can't be, you know, the affordable housing and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and it's two lots. You're not you're you're also uh, you're in a way you, you're stepping out of rent control, perhaps. No. Well, you, you are. And that's one of the interesting things. And one of the objections that many people have had about this is this does not. This law does not require you to build a, an affordable unit as part of the subdivision, for instance. And so that's where, you know, a lot, I should, you know how folks use arguments that they really don't mean in order to try to make a point. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but, yeah. um, you know, uh, a lot of the homeowners associations are saying, well, you know, you're, you're giving away all this value to property owners or business businesses that are creating this new business model utilizing this law and you're not requiring any affordable housing how dare you this is this is terrible right um, I think the the 
the philosophical aspect to all this in Sacramento is number one, single family neighborhoods are not good in urban areas. I think there are some people who just, I know there are people who just believe that, but that by creating more housing itself will eventually lower the price of housing when you, when you actually meet the demand. Uh, we're so far from that, that this is not going, this will be maybe a tool towards meeting the demand, but we still have to do a lot of different planning in a big picture sense to, to, to meet the needs. Um, but um, it is, it could create unique value in, in a lot of circumstances, um, but it's going to be very, you know, very specific to sites and neighborhoods. Some of them, it's just not going to work. I don't think it's going to work to buy, you know, a multi-million dollar piece of property and then try to subdivide it in, in the way that you might like a ranch property up in Chatsworth or in the middle of Reseda. Uh, you know, my, my mother-in-law's, you know, had a very small home on a large piece of property in Atwater Village. And, you know, that would be, I could see that being a very logical place to do something like this. Um, so there are going to be, it's, it's really the, the art in it is really identifying the right properties and the right neighborhoods, because neighborhoods generally have the same kind of property situations with the homes and, and the size of the properties. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's an interesting concept, right? Um, and, um, and we'll see how it all fleshes out, but it, it's created a, a backlash and it's gonna be, to me, just as somebody who follows, you know, governance, if you will, and land use and local government, it's gonna be really interesting to see how government reacts to this, uh, to this push by, by people who wanna really turn it around and say, you've gone too far state of California, enough is enough. And um, you know, we'll see how that all fleshes out. In, in, in terms of the, the adjective interesting, is this interesting and actually new? Are we, we on the, the forefront here, you know, in, in terms of states, as far as you know? Well, uh, Portland has, has uh, I think, gone further. Um, I think maybe Minneapolis or, uh, you know, I think it's Minneapolis also. So there are some cities that have, have pursued similar type of legislation uh, and or states. Um, like, I think Portland did it on a city basis, not uh, the state of Oregon. Um, and I believe the same with Minneapolis. Um, but this, in, in places that have housing shortages, I think this is a, a direction or there's an affordability crisis also. You know, in some cases, there's just limited land. And so the affordability uh, is a problem um, from that perspective. Um, and then there's the urban planners who just really believe intensification uh, of, of communities is, is where we should be going. So there's that uh, terrible terminology of social engineering um, that plays into this to a certain extent. And, um, you know, anything new is going to be um, scary. Uh, but I think, of course, you know, lo looking at the study uh, that um, was put out, I, it doesn't look like this is going to be a wholesale change to single family neighborhoods. But I think folks also look at this as a really big foot in the door that um, could lead to other changes. Um, SB 10, which is state legislation, everybody, I shouldn't say it, a lot of folks really took exception with SB 10, but really what it does is it, it allows municipalities around transit to, in essence, rezone single family neighborhoods to up to 10 units per lot without going through secret review as a city. Now, when you go and do your project in that circumstance, you still have to go through secret review. The interesting thing about SB 9 is there is no secret review. So again, ministerial, you just go pull your permit and if that happens in your neighborhood in a substantial way, you've created a multi-residential neighborhood out of what was once a single family neighborhood. And without any uh, environmental review or any of that. Very, uh, very interesting. I'll check if we 
I don't think we have anybody else here with questions, but uh, Brad, very uh, fascinating. That's what it is. <laughs> I'll put that on to interesting because we'll see how it all, all evolves. And we got, as you mentioned, we have a little taste of it because we see what was happening with the ADUs. Right. So, um, so that gives us maybe a little glimpse of what will happen. Yeah, I think anyway. that I think it really is a um, a precursor, and uh, what you see with that is is you'll see a little bit more and the the ownership opportunity. You know, the concept of subdividing and selling that property, providing an ownership opportunity where it may not have existed because you can put two homes on that and rent one out and, and afford something that you might not have been able to afford under the current circumstance. You know, there may be something to that. I'm going to squeeze one more in the last, we got three minutes. For me, because I don't follow this closely, this came out of the blue for me, you know, hearing about this. Are there other proposals like this that are just like lurking around our legislature? <laughs> that, what's, the, what's the next one? Um, yeah, there probably will be. I can't think of uh, them off the top of my head right now. They're developing their uh, their um, legislation for the next session, so uh, it will be interesting to see what happens. I don't know uh, at the moment what that's going to be, though. And I'm going to la- have here's a personal. We've got two minutes, and someone asks a personal question, right? Do you personally? They're asking, "What do you, Brad Rosenheim, think? Do you personally see it as a positive development?" <laughs> well, and we'll end with that question. <laughs> as as a uh, a person who um, is educated in public policy and city management, I really don't think this is the right way to do land use. Um, I think, I think uh, cities should be more responsible in accommodating the growth that's necessary um, rather than having sort of broad brush policies. I think uh, communities should be preserved. There may be opportunities in certain areas where, where 20,000 square foot lots are really no longer appropriate, but I think that should be left up to local jurisdictions to decide. And the state is putting pressure on local governments through the housing elements to do that. It's just a question of whether or not the cities are really going to live up to that. And so far they haven't. And that's where the state, you know, from the perspective of the big brother, uh, the state really um, is taking on that role and and, um, forcing the issue with local government. So it'll be interesting to see. With that, I want to thank you again, Brad, for a great presentation. Thank you, everyone in the audience, and we'll, we'll see everybody at the next program. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye.